Okay then, so uh, welcome along to this talk. Uh, I'm Jonathan and today I'm going to be telling you a little bit about Crow, which is a project that I have uh, been working on for I guess about the last two years, uh, but no one knew about it for the first year and a bit of that. Uh, so uh, then we uh, revealed it at the, uh, the, uh, the Swiss Pole workshop last summer and uh, continue developing it. So okay, what is Crow? Uh, Crow is a uh, set of libraries and tools for building distributed systems in Perl 6. Uh, it's, uh, that makes it useful both for consuming existing services, uh, for building new individual services, and for building entire systems. And of course, what's good for building uh, a web service is good for building a web application as well. So of course, it's a, a way to do that. Even if we have a, a primarily services target, a lot of web applications today are you know, single page client side application pulling a, a bunch of stuff from a REST API or something. So what is a distributed system? A distributed system is one that involves multiple processes that communicate. Uh, and that may be spread over many virtual machines, real machines, data centers, and so forth. And uh, of course, the, the other defining characteristic of a distributed system is that in the limit, the answer to is it working is some of it, okay? That's what it always converges on. So of course, building something for building distributed systems in general is a pretty big task. So uh, my thought was, well, first we should do at least one thing well before we do lots of things. Uh, so starting out with HTTP services seem like a, a pretty good place to start. They're incredibly common. Uh, we're also already working on zero MQ. We have lots of ideas for the future, but uh, we've started out with, with HTTP and, uh, and web sockets. Crow is also interesting and it's not a port of anything. Crow is the result of uh, 20 years of me building web applications uh, in all kinds of different technologies and uh, also having worked a bunch on Perl 6 and saying how can we try and deliver uh, a nice experience for building these things in Perl 6 and try and get the best out of the, uh, the language. So before I dig into the details of Crow itself, I want to take a slight detour into Perl 6 supplies. What is a supply? It's a stream of asynchronous values. So you might have come across the concept of a promise. Okay, a promise is, or a future sometimes they get called, or a task, um, is something where you set off an operation and later it produces a result and, uh, and we're done. Um, well, a supply is a bit like that. If you, if you think of a promise as being you know, an asynchronous scalar, uh, then a, a supply is kind of like an asynchronous array apart from it's not really because it's more like an iterator. In fact, um, there's a, a mathematical equivalence between uh, supplies and uh, iterable things. Uh, and uh, the way I like to think about it is if I have an iterator, when I want the next value, be it coming from a database or uh, you know, any kind of generator, I pull, okay? I say, give me one more value. And then I sit and I wait until that value is available, and that's what makes it blocking. A supply is a push model. So a value arrives, and it gets pushed through the set of operations uh, uh, in the pipeline. And so it's non-blocking. It's, it's reactive. Okay? And this, uh, this iterable approach is sometimes called interactive instead. So really small example. Uh, what can we do with a, a supply? What sort of things can we model? Uh, time. Okay, so if you imagine uh, ticks of a timer, so I create a, a source of ticks saying uh, I want one every half a second here. We then tap it, and this bit of code says what we want to do, and we get back a tap object which represents the subscription because it turns out that unlike when you're iterating and you get bored, you just let go of it and the garbage collector eats it. With a, uh, an asynchronous source of data, you actually have to manually manage it and say, I'm finished now. Um, and then that will go and uh, every uh, half a second, just print out a timestamp. And then uh, after three seconds of sleeping, uh, we close. And uh, you might then say, where does this code run in this block? And the answer is on a thread in the thread pool. Okay, so that's pretty, uh, pretty boring. Um, but uh, one of the other problems it, with this is that uh, if we just look at it, this is going to be a disaster if we write code like this in uh, a production environment. Why? Well, it's so easy to forget to close 
the tabs. Uh, if you start dealing with multiple sources of asynchronous data, then keeping track of all the subscriptions uh, becomes quite a challenge. Uh, we haven't actually done anything about error handling here. So Perl 6 provides this react whenever construct in order to let us deal with asynchronous data and it manages subscriptions, it manages completion, it manages uh, error handling and so forth. Uh, so this is how I would write a similar uh, version of what I wrote before. So I say react, and you can think of react as starting a little event loop that terminates when there's no more events. Um, and uh, then I say, well, whenever, okay, and whenever is basically like a for loop, <coughs> but asynchronous. And because it's asynchronous, flow control continues straight after it, okay? We don't wait for the messages to come. That would be blocking and synchronous. We go straight down here. We set up our promise in. Okay, so you'll notice that this construct works with promises as well as, uh, as supplies. So what's gonna happen here is it will start giving us these timestamps printed out. Then after three seconds, this block will fire to handle that. Uh, three seconds being up and we say done, and that means we, we don't want to do any more event processing in this construct. <coughs> okay, so that's kind of nice, but uh, let's look at something a little bit more realistic. This is the world's worst HTTP web server, okay? It's a total cheat, but it gives you at least a bit of an idea. So I say I want to react, and then I do a listen on an asynchronous socket. I uh, get a connection object from that, okay? So this whenever will fire whenever I get a new incoming connection. Then I say whenever the connection emits some data, then do a print on that socket, and whenever that has completed, close the socket, okay? And uh, that, of course, is terrible. Uh, we're, we're sending back the response as soon as we get sent anything, but I hope it gives you a, a small picture of, of something a little bit more interesting than just a, a bunch of, of timers. One of the other neat things that we can do is use whenever, not in a React, but in a supply. The supply construct is, is actually really central to what Crow does. Um, and supply uh, is for processing one or more sources of asynchronous data and producing a new stream. So basically, if we consider this, okay, this is a way that I can build a timeout mechanism for asynchronous streams. So I've declared a, uh, an exception at the top here. Uh, that's just a, a, a timed out exception, and that is so we can reliably deal with exceptions uh, of that kind. Um, and then I, here in timeout, I take a supply, uh, and I take a number of seconds. Actually, the parentheses after that mean I want to coerce into a supply or coerce into a number of seconds. And this supply block in here is, if you like, it's, it's almost like a little message processing object. And whenever we tap it, we will then run the code inside of this block. So what we'll do is we will subscribe to the underlying source of messages. And whenever a message is pushed to us, we will refresh the timeout and we'll emit the message. And at the start, we just call refresh timeout to set the initial timeout. What does that do? We keep track of the current timeout subscription in this tap state variable. If we already had one, we close it. That dot question mark means try to call the method if there is one, but if there isn't, don't care. And then we just say, oh, and whenever this number of seconds has elapsed, die, we've timed out. Now that die will propagate the exception asynchronously, and it will close this subscription here as well, so we don't leak it. And if instead this subscription somehow produced an exception, Okay, this lot gets cleaned up, it's fine. If this comes to completion, okay, we drop the timeout and uh, ignore it in the future. And then I can take this, I can stick it uh, just wrapped around my incoming source of data here, and now I have a timeout mechanism and I can handle the, uh, the exception. Quit is for handling asynchronous exceptions and uh, I can close it. So you can see here what we have in Perl 6, okay, none of this is Crow, this is just standard Perl 6, 
is a mechanism for dealing with streams of asynchronous data. Now, Crow builds on top of this uh, through a kind of component model. So the idea of Crow is that messages are processed, be they HTTP requests or TCP packets or uh, you know, zero MQ messages or whatever, by shoving them through a chain of these reactive supplies. Now, the nice thing is you don't often, to use it, actually have to think much about that, but it means that from the very ground up, it is a completely asynchronous model. So let's build the simplest uh, possible thing I could think of, which is a, a TCP service that just rot 13s anything we send it and sends that back. So I will use crow. I will use crow TCP. And I will write a component here, which is a transform. This transform consumes TCP messages and produces new TCP messages. It then has an implementation of the transformer. This is written as a supply block. And we say, whenever we receive messages, and uh, just like with four, the message goes into dollar underscore. Okay, and then I want to emit a new message, and the data in that message will be, well, the data of the message that came in, okay, that dot method call is uh, on dollar underscore by default, uh, and then we decode it as Latin 1, we uh, brought 13 it there, and uh, then we encode it back into Latin 1, ignore this, it, it doesn't matter for the talk today, um, and uh, that gets us a, uh, a component that can rot 13. Now, let's compose this with a TCP listener. That gives us a crow service object. And someone uh, might just have noticed why crow is called crow now. Read this declaration. Micro service. Micro service. Oh, dear. OK. So uh, sorry, not sorry. Um, but uh, OK. And I can't believe I've got this far into a talk about the demo, so let's do one. OK, so uh, hello. So here it is. And uh, that's just running now. And let's telnet to it. Let's uh, write some, some words. OK, this is all the German that I know. OK, so uh, there we go. OK, so uh, it works. OK, so no, that is not my talk. There it is. All right. So, uh, the connection handling, connection management, and sending the response are actually handled automatically for us. Very nice. Uh, so there we go. That's a TCP service. How about a HTTP one? Let's build a HTTP service. So, uh, and again, this is, this is the plumbing level of Crow. OK, we'll get to the porcelain, the nice high level stuff later. This is a transform, again. But this time, it consumes a HTTP request and produces a HTTP response. The transformer then says, well, whenever we get a request, and a nice little syntactic thing, if you're using a supply and there's only one whenever, you don't need to write a block and have another level of indentation. Just supply whenever, OK? A request comes in. Then I make a response. Uh, the status will be 200. Uh, and we will set a text plane header, we'll set a body, and we'll emit the response message. Okay. Now, all I need to make this a HTTP service is to take it, and I need something that will uh, listen for incoming requests, so that's a TCP listener. I then need to pass those requests from TCP messages into HTTP ones, so that is a HTTP request passer. Uh, I then have my application in the middle. I compose a response serializer, which turns a HTTP response into a stream of TCP messages. And uh, we're done. OK, and we run the client. Sorry, run the server. Uh, and uh, there we go. That's a HTTP server. One of the things that you might realize about this is that you can plug anything you want into the, this pipeline. In fact, middleware is just a component. So if I want to log responses, ah, there we are. We just stick a logging thing in and we're done. Okay. So 
while many uh, libraries and frameworks for doing uh, web and distributed system stuff have a concept of middleware, uh, Crow kind of says, well, huh, what happens if everything is middleware? And uh, that's basically the, uh, the model that we have. Meaning that if for some reason you decide that you, uh, you hate the way we pass requests, and you say, oh, I know this C library. It'll pass it in no time, OK? You can just shove it in there. It'll work fine. But this is all plumbing. It's flexible. It means you can do what you want. It's the model beneath it, but it isn't exactly what you would want to do every day to build a web application. And just, uh, I stole the Git terminology here, OK? We have plumbing commands, uh, which are the, the low-level things, and then you have porcelain commands, uh, which are the high-level things that you use every day. And of course, you can understand what's going on a bit better if you know a bit about the plumbing, but you don't really have to. Um, and uh, the porcelain is what most Crow users work with most of the time. So we'll spend the rest of the talk on that. OK, so the HTTP porcelain. Ooh, a demo. OK, let's do this. So Crow comes with a, uh, a command line tool. Um, and uh, is, is this font even big enough, or shall we, shall we do something about that? It's OK? It could be bigger. Yeah, that's what I thought. It was, and then the resolution changed. Where did they put this? Oh, there. There it is. Um, 21. That's a nice, weird number. OK, uh, so let me uh, go over here. And uh, the crow command line tool uh, has a bunch of options. One thing I can do is I can say crow stub a service. Uh, I can pick a template name, which will be HTTP. Uh, I need to give this an ID. Let's call it my test. Uh, let's just stick it in a directory called my test. And this will ask me a few questions. No, let's not bother with HTTPS today. Yes, HTTP 1. No, not 2. Ah, yeah, let's have WebSockets. OK. What it has now done is uh, stubs me a, a little project in here. Uh, you get a few things in this. Uh, you. Uh, you have service p6, which is the, uh, the entry point. Uh, we have a meta6.json. So this straight out of the box is something you can use with all the Perl6 toolchain. And you can declare your dependencies inside of that. Uh, that's nothing crow specific. That's just a Perl6 thing. Uh, we have a Docker file. So this actually builds a Docker container for you straight away if you need it, uh, if you're deploying that way. That's how I've deployed all of my crow things so far. Uh, which has been kind of nice. And uh, inside of lib, we, we have a, uh, a file of, uh, of roots. Now, if I just do crow run, then uh, it will bring up that service. And if I uh, then go to, uh, there we are. It's listening on port 20,000. And if we just curl it, oh, OK. It worked. Okay, so fine. Now, uh, that's a lot of messing around at the command line, but it turns out that we, we also built a little web interface as well. Uh, so if I just pop over to a browser here, and uh, there we go. And you'll see it's found my, my service here, and it's already running it. Uh, but uh, we can go and stub ourselves a new service. Let's call it another test. And Oh, actually, that's the ID. This can, this can have a nicer name. Ooh, 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 I can't spell. OK. Oh, I don't care. Um, and then we can actually even tell it that we want to link it to other services, which uh, gets it to inject the, uh, the, path, the uh, host and the uh, environment variable and that runs on. A, sorry, the, uh, the port it runs on as well. Ah, so now I have two services, OK, both running. And uh, if I just open that. OK, there was my first one. There was my second one. And uh, one other thing you can do is actually stick it into trace mode. And then we'll go to this logs and traces. And I think it's another test that I want to look at. If I had just make a, I think it was this one, a request to this now, this works at the command line too, you'll notice in here that it's actually done a full uh, log of all of the, the requests that, uh, that came in, uh, both at a, uh, a TCP level. And uh, you can trace through and see what it has, uh, has passed into as a, a request object. 
okay, and, uh, and so on and so forth, which is pretty neat if you need to go and debug uh, middleware stuff. Uh, you can, can go and take a look at exactly what it is, uh, it is doing. Okay, so let's talk a bit about what is in those files. So we don't actually stick together a pipeline for a HTTP <coughs> server using crow.compose by hand. That would be pretty tedious. Instead, we use this crow HTTP server to do it for us. It also just builds a crow service. Um, in fact, it, it just inherits from it. And instead of us having to mess around pulling in a request parser and so forth, we just uh, send in the host, the port. If we want to secure it, we send in the the private key file and certificate file uh, for uh, TLS. We then uh, send along the application. Any middleware that goes after it, of course, there's a before as well, if needed. Um, and uh, then we get a service and we can start it. Now, you might think that doesn't save me all that much, but if you want to do HTTP2 and also HTTP1, then actually what you need is a pipeline that is conditional uh, and uh, that will, will actually detect the protocol that we want to speak, uh, version one or version two. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that actually means it makes a, a relatively involved pipeline. So that's how we uh, have the server. Uh, what if we would like a way to write our request handlers though? Because of course, you know, as I showed, you can write a crow transform that gets a request that produces a response. Uh, but uh, what if we, we want a nicer way of doing this, something a bit more high level? So this is where crow HTTP router comes in. And depending on what you've worked with, the, the basic idea of this might be somewhat familiar. Uh, we say, well, when there's a get, okay, and this is a get to the, uh, the root of the, uh, uh, the root URL, the root path, then what I want to do is respond with some content. In this case, it's text plain, and the body will just be hello from crow. Now, a root block also produces something that does the crow transform role. Okay, so it's just a nicer way of building that. One of the things that I thought about when I was designing this is how, ca how can we try and you know, take something that Perl6 does really nicely in order to, to build uh, the, uh, the, the web application routing. And I realized that we could actually use Perl6 signatures as a nice way of doing this. Uh, Perl6 signatures are very powerful, both in the fact that they can do quite a lot, but in that they're also first class objects, which means we can introspect them and we can derive data from them. And uh, in this case, actually figure out how to compile a web request router out of them. So just as a few simple examples here, uh, if I just want to make something where you can do a request to slash greet slash name, okay, I just put get greet dollar name. And what's nice is that we immediately take the variable as a parameter here so we don't ever get chance to typo it, okay, by, uh, by having it in one place and, uh, and then having to unpack it somewhere else. Named parameters, are used for things from the query string by default. Uh, so we can, can grab things from, uh, from that. It turns out also if you, uh, if you stick uh, the is cookie or is header trait on there, you can also pull stuff directly out of the, uh, the headers and out of the cookies. And if you want all the headers or all the cookies, uh, then you can actually just take a, a hash parameter and mark it is cookie or is default and you get all of them, which is kind of cute. Slurpy parameters match all of the root segments. Okay, so uh, this is particularly convenient if you want to serve a bunch of, uh, say, assets like uh, CSS or JavaScript. So we just say take all of the, uh, the various root segments there, and then this static thing jails this path beneath this one, meaning that nobody can go and do a dot dot slash path traversal style things. So again, kind of convenient. And uh, static is smart enough to look at extensions and map them to content types and things like that. One of the other neat things we can do since it's a Pulse signature is stick types in there. So suppose that I only want this to match 
uh, and be, a, be a, a 404 error if this is not a valid UUID. So I write a subset UUID v4 of string. I write a regular expression there that matches it and I just stick it into the signature and that will validate that root parameter. And you can use various of the built-in types like int and uh, unsigned int and so on as well for that. For authorization and authentication and session and set things, um, we provide on the request object an auth property. Any middleware can set that. Uh, we provide a bunch of built-in ones that deal with things like basic authentication, uh, with in-memory sessions, with database-based sessions, uh, with Java, uh, sorry, uh, JavaScript web tokens and so forth. And uh, if we set that to an object that does the crew HTTP auth role, uh, then it also can be constrained in the root segments. So here I have a couple of roots. I've declared a couple of subset types here that are subsets of my session object. This one just checks the is admin property. This one checks the is logged in property. And then we can just constrain it saying, I want a logged in user when I visit my profile. Okay? Or get for admin users only the system log. And uh, again, this is just normal Pulse signature behavior that if you don't actually want a, uh, the, the value in a variable, you just want it to match the, the type, then uh, you don't have to. You just put the type there. One of the things that I've tried really hard to do when designing this was to try and make it do the right thing automatically for you. So a lot, one of the ways that we uh, do that is by taking that nice declarative signature and t producing the correct HTTP error responses whenever there's a problem. So for example, if a root segment doesn't match, that becomes a 404. Uh, if the method is wrong, so there's no post handler, but you only a get one, and you do a post, we produce a 405. If the auth doesn't match, it's a 401. Okay, if the query string doesn't match, uh, the best we can do is a 400 bad request there. So we, we try and uh, do some sensible defaulting there also. I mentioned earlier, we have HTTP2 support. Uh, HTTP2 supports something called a push promise. And the idea of a push promise is that normally if I, I serve out a web page and it requires some, uh, some style sheet or it requires some, uh, some JavaScript, the browser sees it and it has to make a new web request okay, to get it and it's all a big round trip. With push promises, you can actually send out a response uh, along with the, the initial response saying, oh, you'll probably need this as well. And all we do for that is we just say, I want to send the push promise for this URL. And all that will happen is that when we send the response, we will also uh, trigger a request that will be processed through the router as normal. And then we will send a push promise and we will send the push promise response along with it as well. And uh, actually, it's kind of important that you send push promises before you send the response body, so that the browser actually has them first. Um, and uh, in Crow, it doesn't actually matter which order you do it in. We sort them into the right order for you anyway. Uh, but uh, that's just another little detail we take care of. So I, I think that makes push promises relatively easy, which is kind of nice. WebSockets. WebSockets fit beautifully with Perl 6 supplies. This is a very, very simple little chat server. So what I need to make this work is an object called a supplier. A supplier is basically a, a way that we can make a stream of values. And the way we do it is just by emitting values on it. So what I'm going to use it for here is as a little publish subscribe mechanism in order to send all chat messages to all users. So here I have a get request. It comes to chat. We then say, actually, this get request is going to be upgraded to be a WebSocket. And what I get is two things. I get an incoming, which is a supply of messages that are received from over the WebSocket from the browser or the client. I get a, optionally can take a promise, which will be kept when the connection is closed by the browser. 
And what I'm expected to return from this block is a supply of messages that should be sent to the browser. Inside of it, I subscribe to the incoming messages from the browser, and then I emit them into this supplier. I then subscribe to this chat supplier, and then I send whatever is coming from it out to this particular browser, this particular client, and then here I can just send a user left a chat whenever somebody leaves. So what happens is every time someone makes a WebSocket connection, we will come in here, okay, we will start listening to their messages and publishing them, we'll start listening to the published messages from everyone else and sending them, and when the connection closes, this subscription and this subscription will both be cleaned up automatically for us. And uh, that's it. That's a, uh, the simplest possible little chat server. If you're building a slightly bigger application, uh, you will need to be able to compose routes uh, together. We have two ways of doing it. 10 minutes, cool, I'm on time. Uh, we have two ways of doing it. Uh, one of them is include. The semantics of include are designed specifically so if you take some routes that are in your root block and you copy paste them into another root block and then you include that one, everything will keep working. Okay, so it basically is almost like textual include semantics. Not quite, but pretty close. So you can also prefix it. Okay, that makes it a little bit more interesting. So if I have a bunch of roots produced by this subroutine, that just returns a root block, uh, and I want to prefix them all under the prefix slash search slash whatever, all I have to do is just uh, map it like this. As well as include, we have delegate. So include works with other root blocks. Delegate works with any crow transform, which means that if someday somebody writes, say, a GraphQL implementation as a crow transform, then you'd be able just to plug it in inside of this, uh, this root block. So again, the design principle here is, you know, we'll try and provide you with a bunch of things that you would want and then make it easy for you to bring in other things when you need more than what we give out of the box. Also, of course, when we get a, a response, uh, sorry, a request and we send a response, we also care about dealing with the body. The body might be, say, JSON, uh, some text, some HTML. So we have a, a built-in model of pluggable body passes. And uh, here is how we deal with getting a JSON re uh, request body and see, uh, passing it. So what I do here is I say I want the request body. I want it to be application JSON. Then I use a Perl6 signature to destructure the data. This extra pair of parentheses here takes a hash, in this case, and breaks it up and pulls out the keys and puts them into variables. But even more than that, it validates. So we say we have to have a string name, we have to have a string description, and we have to have a price, which is a real value that's greater than zero. And if that validation fails, it'll automatically produce a 400 response for us. We can then just send the JSON response. Okay, we say the content is application on JSON. We put a Pulse 6 object in there, and it will be serialized. We've got built-in support for a bunch of the common cases, URL encoded, uh, multi-part forms, JSON, and so forth. If we don't have what you want, you just plug in a body parser, either at root block level or at server level. I mentioned earlier you can put middleware on the server. You can also actually do it per root block as well. And we have a, a very convenient block form for doing this. So you can use before and after. You can probably guess the meanings of those. Okay, Before we run the root, the root handler or after we run the root handler. And you can put a middleware object there. But we also have this block form. So here, for example, if I wanted to block anything not from the local host, 
I can just say before any request is handled in this block, unless the connection is from here, then return forbidden. Okay, and then it will notice that we have put a response in place and it'll skip the rest of the handling. If I wanted to introduce a, uh, a strict transport security header, okay, again, I say after, add a header, we're done. Okay, so uh, that, that's middleware in, uh, in root blocks too. All of these requests are actually processed in the thread pool. Uh, so uh, even if you're doing HTTP2 and one request takes quite a while uh, and another one on the same connection can be served up really quick, uh, then actually the, uh, the quick one will, will beat it. Uh, we, uh, we handle that pretty well. With HTTP1, that's a little bit less important, but it means the, the application scales over threads, which is kind of nice. Oh, and we have a HTTP client too which I'll spend my last couple of minutes on, okay? Uh, this is just a quick little example of the HTTP client. Uh, again, I wanted to show off our HTTP2 support. So uh, this is how push promises look as a client. So I make a web request. I say I want to use HTTP2. I want to accept push promises. By default, we don't accept them. Um, but uh, it would be a bit wasteful otherwise. We'd just throw them away. Okay, but uh, you declare that you want to get them and use them. Then we uh, say, well, whenever uh, there is a, uh, 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 ah, yes, whenever there is a push promise that arrives in response to this request, and whenever there's a response from that push promise, and whenever we get the body of that, you can see all of this is asynchronous. Okay, you can actually also retrieve bodies in a streaming way for doing large downloads. Then we'll just print out, oh, we got a push promise to this URL, uh, this status, and this many bytes. Okay, and uh, push promises, it turns out sometimes a server will send the push promise and immediately cancel it, which is pretty weird, but they, they seem to do that. Uh, so uh, here we, we just decide to ignore uh, cancel push promises. One of the things I like about this is this is all a bunch of asynchronous code. Um, you know, the... Uh, the responses could come actually in any order in HTTP2. There's no, uh, no sort of tying of them to uh, the order that the push promises were sent in. It'd be unusual, I guess, but it, uh, it can happen. Uh, so uh, this will just process them in whatever order they came in. Um, so uh, again, it's, it's fairly neat. And yeah, that, that's just the boring feature list of what the HTTP2, sorry, the HTTP uh, client does. Okay, so persistent connections. Um, it, it actually maintains a connection pool for HTTP 1, for HTTP TTP 2, because you can multiplex, it just reuses one connection for the lot. Uh, we have pluggable body passes and serializers there as well, the very same ones as on the server side. Actually, uh, both sides are using the same request and the response objects. When I set off on this, I wondered if building a client and a server using the same request and response types would be reasonable. It turns out, yes, it is, works very nicely. And when we get to implementing uh, reverse proxying and so on, that will be really nice because you just tweak the, re the request a bit and then proxy it forward. Okay, so that was a whirlwind tour of some of the things we have in Crow. Um, this is just the beginning. You know, this is, uh, I've got a lot of things I'm looking forward to achieving with this. Uh, but judging from the early feedback from uh, early adopters, uh, this is already a, a fairly useful and interesting beginning. If you want to learn more, uh, we have a website. Uh, it's uh, crow.services. Um, yes, you can actually write my.crow.services too, and it works because just for fun. Um, and uh, there's an IRC channel on Freenode. Uh, you can follow on Twitter to find out about latest releases and so on. Uh, I have used pretty much all my time. I don't know if I have time for any questions, yeah. but I will, I have. Yeah, there's a lunch break following, so you have time for questions. Okay, you can, you can either ask questions or you can eat. <laughs> okay. Can, you can have a quote. I question for you. Uh, the example you showed in the slide, uh, is it readily, readily available? Can we grab those code and try a uh, hand? Uh -huh. um, I... 
the, the question was, is the code <laughs> readily available? Um, no, but it can be. I, I will shove them in a GitHub repository, and uh, then they'll be easily available. Great. And the slides also uh, are on my website. So, uh, yep. And I'm just Jonathan, J-N-T-H-N, on GitHub. <coughs> yep. Any more? I, is that a hand there? So I have really bad eyesight, so I can't, if you're at the back of the room, you'll have to really <laughs> wave. <So> okay. <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> not at the moment. No, that's an interesting feature request. But no, uh, at the moment you just get a uh, the host as a string, so not as some cl more clever object. But we we could potentially pass it for you into something a bit nicer. Yeah, that's an interesting request. Okay, any any more? No. Oh, one here. You've shown an example um, listing some CSS files that are served statically from a from file. Mm -hmm. um, does Go include um, building up URLs uh, from your URL, uh, from your application to some other application path, um, even if the application is mounted on a web server behind some logger path? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, at the moment, no, we don't have a way to go from root back to URL yet. Uh, no, that's that's something that's on the on the wish list decidedly because of course, when you go refactoring later, it's uh, it's a pain if it doesn't do that. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's something that's on my mind. Okay. Okay, I don't see any more. So, all right. Well, hope that was interesting. Thank you very much.